Okay, good morning. I'm gonna go ahead and call this meeting of the Taurus Rooting House Ad Hoc Committee to order. And Andy um, is sitting in for Lynn today. Hold on one second. I can... Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Are you muted on Zoom? Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. muted. It's your, it's your audio. You're going to turn it on. Okay, that's better. <laughs> testing, testing. All right, Andy, can you give us a roll call, please? Thank you, Andy, for filling in for our clerk today. Yeah, hopefully this goes all right. <laughs> Jenny Chavek. Here. Phil Nice. Sure. Tweed Schumann, he is absent. Stacey Hessel. Marshall Savitsky. Jim Tiffany. John Volmers. Cheryl Treeland. Oh, John is. I'm, I'm here, guys. All right, thank you, John. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, gotcha. Thanks. Cheryl Treeland? CJ Demansky? Here. Martin Hansen? Here. Ryan Carey? Laura Rusk? You have a quorum. Thank you. All right, if we all could please stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the states of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> all right, Andy, do you have public the um Certification of compliance with open meeting laws. Yes, this meeting has been noticed in compliance with open meetings laws. Thank you. All right, we're now gonna go ahead and open up to public comments. We've got a few folks that have signed up to speak today. Dave Steyer, please come up and give your name and address. Mr. Steyer, can you wrap it up, please? Neighboring Crawford's since most people haven't taken the time or don't even know where to look for this thing when it gives. I would ask that you add an item E, copy of this ordinance, to the uh, order providing two ups in the future. So we know what our recourse is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Andy, I had someone say that they couldn't hear the audio. I got it. Yeah. All right, next, Brian Gilner. Good morning, Brian Gilner, 1662 North Sunset Beach Drive, Birchwood. Again, as Dale said, thank you for hearing us. Um, I'm gonna review something I mentioned last month too, is that, again, we have currently no provision to contact the owner or owner's agent. I know that's in the ordinance, but I guess that speaks to the timing. Whenever this gets enacted, which could be next month, could be a year or two years, I don't know. In the meantime, if something happens on the Airbnbs next to us, we have no provision to reach the owner to say this is happening or that's happening. 
and that's a problem. I hope you will address that before this gets enacted. As an example, Section 14.4.12e talks about waste receptacles being secured. Well, they're not. We have bears in the air. They're in their, their garbage. So I mentioned to them that they should put them in the garage. Nothing happened. Bears still come around and go through the garbages. So, again, contacting the owners, I think, is something I'd like you to consider. The other one much like Dale said, is that, okay, one of the owners, we talked about um, some kind of regulations and whatnot, and they said they don't care about any more Airbnbs coming in because they see it as a property enhancement to their own property. Okay, the problem is an incoming prospective buyer is not going to look at that the same way, I don't think. I know you're in real estate, but... I would not buy a house that's next to an Airbnb for that reason. So I don't see how that helps the homeowners. So I guess what I like to see is that you guys are thinking about current homeowners that are here 12 months every day, all year long, not just the ones that come in every week. And lastly, I guess I'd like to know who enforces this ordinance once it's enacted. Because right now it's us. It's Mary Stibby. <laughs> you got to be a little taller, Mary. <laughs> no, I'm not taller. <laughs> Here. And you'll fix it for me. There you go. Dino Lake Drive is, is a private road with five homes. A little bit more at my height. <laughs> you want me to sit down? Thank you. Um, I agree with what has just been said as far as this is a zoning issue. This is a commercial business that has been allowed to be built and operated in a residential area. For us, it was a lot that was sold, would sold and uh purchased with the sole intention of putting up a, a TRH rental house. And I agree, it's going to affect my ability to resell our property. And I've yet to hear from anyone either that, that wants to be living next to one. Um, I do have a few questions regarding the maximum occupancy. Please clarify that the plus two. Is this for each bedroom or the entire house? Uh, for those on a septic system, the number of bedrooms, um, are they determined by the septic, the original septic permit? The number of bedrooms should be um, based on that original construction permit with the septic system size. My example is a home that was sized for two bedrooms, then built with three bedrooms, and one bedroom is furnished with four single beds. So uh, it would be over the capacity. Regarding notification of neighbors, I believe that the neighbors should receive a copy of the house rules since, again, it appears that the neighbors are the ones to police the issues. Um, I've seen campers on the property. Uh, I had a pit bull lunge at me one morning. Um, neither of those, uh, by the advertisement, are allowed, and the owner was unaware of the occurrence until we notified him. I also believe that the neighbor, neighboring properties should be provided documentation on what they can do with an issue arises. The first time that uh, I confronted the, the owner uh, for direction, do I call the, uh, we had uh, women screaming at 2 a.m. on an April night out on the deck, and I contacted the owner the next morning. His response to me was, I needed to know that I now have neighbors. I have concerns. I continue to have concerns with fire, um, campfires. Um, we need to keep our windows closed because of smoke of the frequent burning. A fire pit, it, the fire pit next door is, is uh, 25 feet from the property line. And based on the smoke that we have had to deal with, 
Um, I believe that 25 feet should require a smokeless burner and a means to extinguish the fire, be it a lid or a water source. Currently, neither exists over there. And we've seen unattended fires. We've seen fires burning well into the next day after the property has been vacated. My text messages to the owner, I have not received a response. And when I raised it directly, he said he was pretty sure that there was no law to, for leaving a fire unattended and that I worry too much. So out of frustration, I contacted the DNR uh, Forestry for information and direction on how to address the concern. Most recently, I observed two uh, renters, uh, fairly young boys, trying to rem remove a road sign from our property. Uh, it was placed to slow motorists because we have uh, neighbors and ourselves, we have pets and we walk the road. Uh, and on June 29th and on the August 16th, we had two different parties of renters trespass onto our property to use our dock. In the first instance, the neighbors reported our neighbors also reported seeing them the previous day when we were not home. To do this, they would have had to walk around a fence that the owner had placed on the lot line, cross 100 feet into our backyard, and walk down a staircase to the dock. When they were confronted, they said they were unable to fish from the owner's dock and thought they, that we weren't home, so it would be okay. I was not aware, uh, not aware of the complaint form on the county website until recent conversations with Matt. So I thank you for that. Um, and I have given some copies to the group. Thank you very much and thank you for your work. Thank you. Is that K or N? K. K. K, I think. K Ryan. Morning, and thank you for allowing us to speak today. I'm Kay Ryan. I live at 9420 North Dunrovin Road, um, just down by Dunrovin Resort. I've lived there since 2005 and have seen what's happened. I brought a few numbers with me. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Dunrovin Road is the inlet and outlet only on the Dunrovin Peninsula. We have three roads there, Hay Creek Road, Beaver Creek Road, and Dunrovin Road, but with only one ingress and egress. We have approximately 54 homes in the neighborhood now with another one going up. Of those 54 homes, 11 of them are short-term rentals. You can imagine the influx of the traffic, the people, the dogs, the children, whatever, on a weekly basis. You've heard the horror stories from other people. Magnify that by 11, because we have it. We have the garbage, the bears hauling it around. We have the loud noise, the fireworks, the continual uh, havoc. Uh, my puppy and I were chased by a large um, lab one day, and we were rescued by a neighbor who opened up her back door and let us into her car. So they don't control our animals. They don't control the noise. They do leave fires unattended. I have seen that myself. Uh, I have observed one unit on Hay Creek Road within the last three weeks. It's a three bedroom, two bath home. Had seven vehicles in the driveway for a week. I don't think they all drove alone. A couple years ago, there was another one on Beaver Creek Road and uh, there were, from what I was told to, from the next door neighbor, there was 14 young men in that house. The music started on Saturday. I tried to find out who the owner was through the GIS system with no avail. There were six people that lived in St. Paul with his name. So I tried contacting someone who would know. I called the neighbor that lived next door. I live about a half a block away. And I asked them if they were gonna contact someone. They said that they were afraid of retribution. There was 14 boys there. So, I said I was going to call. I, had, I was done. And he, was, he didn't want me to call because he was afraid that they were going to think that he called. So it's not always easy to be an enforcer, I guess is what I'm saying. And enforcement is the biggest thing. I did call the sheriff at 1030 on night number four when the music hadn't stopped and the fireworks 
was going on. The reason I called is because they were fighting amongst themselves. And I could hear the profanity a half a block or more away. And I was afraid someone was going to get hurt. They did settle down, but it took two officers time. Isn't there more important things for them to do? We make an ordinance, but where is the enforcement? Where is the retribution of, this, of these things being taken care of? You can't make an ordinance with no teeth. It doesn't work. You can write all you want, but if you don't have a sign that says, I can call this person. If I'm up at one o'clock in the morning, I want that owner to be up at one o'clock in the morning. I want them to go through what they've been going through. I want them to live in my house and deal with this on a weekly basis. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time. Linda Zilmer. I don't know if she wants that red or. I don't know. <laughs> Linda Zilmer, uh, fourth generation property owner in the town of Edgewater. And the town of Edgewater does have a P.O. box of Birchwood. So there are towns in four counties that have a Birchwood address. But I um, uh, wanted to also clarify too that um, I appreciate the newspaper covering what happens at these meetings. But there, I think it was confusing. Uh, one of the items was already mentioned at the beginning of the article. It talked about two per bedroom plus two per bedroom, but at the end of the article, I think it was two per bedroom plus two. Um, I also uh, believe that, um, and, and these folks don't know it, but having attended meetings here for so many years, there is a bias against people that aren't deemed constituents of Sawyer County. If you're just property owners or as shown at zoning last Friday, even if you're a resident and or a property owner, if you just live here, you just don't seem to carry as much weight or your concerns don't carry as much weight. And so it is important to understand that these folks from Sunset Beach are Edgewater, Sawyer County property owners. Um, and I would also like to speak to the enforcement issue that uh, going down to Sunset Beach is just a prime example of the lack of enforcement in many areas regarding zoning in Sawyer County. It's not just tourist rooming houses, it's campers and uh, multiple other things. Um, you know, finally, after years and years, just um, this effort most recently came up um, with a look at what other counties are doing. And most other counties do do this through zoning. I don't see how you can do this otherwise through zoning. And uh, I think some people are coming around to that realization. And anyone who sticks with the licensing ordinance and thinks that's going to solve the problems that you're hearing, I think that's mistaken. And if you're not part of the solution, you're really part of the problem. So as much as work has been put into this, I think that a licensing ordinance is not the way to go. And I've heard no serious conversation of what this would look like as a process in either zoning or HHS. And HHS has far more important things to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody online that wish to speak? Said a no? Okay. All right, I do have a letter that um, was asked to be read in by Mary Seitz. And she says, um, thank you for all the time and energy you put into the Sawyer County Tourist Rooming House Committee. I strongly support your efforts and assure you that all, is also widespread support among my neighbors. Though most arguments have been made, I would like to emphasize a couple. One, we repeatedly read the opinion be it for short-term rentals, four-wheelers wheel, four wheel, four on county and town roads, campgrounds, et cetera, and Sawyer County, that something will negatively impact the tourism industry and tourism. Perhaps it's time to prioritize these, um, prioritize some other stakeholders. Year after year, local businesses have reported record profits due to tourists. How much profit is enough when others are negatively affected? Number two, many of us have moved and or lived here for years. Um, because of the solitude and beauty of the surrounding resources. We do not rent our homes and quietly go about our lives. Our very lifestyle has been threatened by changes such as the influx of short-term rentals into our neighborhoods and the issues that have come with them. Number three, short-term rentals are businesses. Many near me are used solely as rentals. I'm confused as to how a neighborhood can be zoned residential and yet have short-term rental businesses insert themselves into residential areas. 
Thank you again for your work. And again, that's Mary Seitz, 10217 and Comstock Road, Hayward, Wisconsin. And then Doug, did you wanna come up and speak please? Oh. Is that working? Okay. Douglas Kurtzwell, 11055W, Arrow Road, Hayward, Wisconsin. First comment I'm going to make is to what I've heard here so far today is uh, massive mega dittos. It's a litany of things that those of us who have had the uh, experience of living next door to these short term rentals live with constantly. Uh, and then I guess, because I only have three minutes, I'm real quickly going to go through the proposed ordinance changes. Uh, I don't know the numbering in the printout that I printed from the website is different, but it's in definitions. P, short-term rental, means a residential dwelling that is offered for rent or fee for fewer than 30 consecutive days. The excellent sidebar in the article in the paper last week uh, points out that uh, you do have a uh, well, I, I believe the right to rent law actually does provide for a seven to 29 day period for the ordinance that you folks are, are considering. Uh, anything shorter than uh, seven days, if it's two, three days, something like that, that's basically allowing a motel or hotel operation, a robotic hotel motel operation in residential neighborhoods. Uh, I think if they're going to operate a, a, a commercial enterprise, they ought to be appropriately zoned for it. One thing to consider. Other proposed changes. Uh, the two plus two, two per bedroom plus two. I had a conversation with a member of this committee on the way in and asked where that came from, and uh, they indicated it was from audience comments. I haven't heard any audience comments like that for the last uh, several meetings. Uh, I asked where was the science, and this individual indicated there is none, and then tried to go into some kind of an explanation. I said, asked and answered. Okay, and then in uh, owner, owner responsibilities, uh, the eight by 10 inch sign, thank God, thank you. But with contact info, a name, a phone number, and a valid email address. In many places in rural Sawyer County, believe it or not, cell reception is not real good. And I have a feeling some of these owner agents, especially the smaller operations or single operations, it's going to be a cell number. Or even the owners, it's going to be a cell number. And cell coverage does not work all that well in many of the rural areas of Sawyer County. And then also the requirement that someone who has a problem is going to have to sign an affidavit validating that they actually filed a complaint. With email, they've got a record, real easy. Email is forever. So name, phone number, valid email address. And if they have to go uh, eight, by, eight by 12 or 10 by 12 or 12 by 15, so be it. But a name, a, a phone number, and a valid email address. Uh, congratulations on moving from 100 feet for notification to 200 feet for the neighbors. Uh, never was an auctioneer, but do I hear three? I'd like to. Hundred, that is. And then also, uh, item three in that one. No, not notifications, that's fine. The only other one is a uh, number of complaints. It was, uh, it was five or more calls within a year. And that's being reduced to three in three months. That tightens things up a little bit. Uh, they're going to have to be a real bad actor, I guess, in order to reach that threshold. And then the overwhelming comment is, where is the enforcement? I've uh, had the opportunity to deal with an enforcement issue three times since last October uh, regarding the occupation of an unlicensed unit right next door to me. And... Consistently, enforcement personnel, when they've been on site, whether they're, they're from zoning or HHS, but enforcement, they get lied to by the occupants, and they accept it. They, okay, that's what they're telling me, and then they leave. 
And uh, on two occasions, the offending occupants were gone before the sun was down that day after being contacted. Uh, yeah, wrap it up, Doug. Without enforcement, you got a piece of crap. And there is no enforcement in the current uh, version. Thank you. Thank you. All right, did we get everybody? Frank? <clears throat> I have a question. Um, has the committee ever considered um, requiring the owner or the person, uh, contact person, to actually engage with the people renting as they're renting? Um, I recently went with my sister out to Black Hills. We rented a house, and, um, you know, it's all remote. Never met the owner. No contact, no communication. Um, I like to think we were good renters, and we didn't. there was no problems, but... Um, um, was, was that ever a possible consideration, make that a requirement? You know, if you have renters there that you need to call them as they are there or have a person show up who represents the owner or the contact person, just like you do when you check into a hotel or a resort, you, you, you visibly, visibly have contact uh, uh, with a person. Um, I, don't, I don't think that was ever given any consideration, but I was just throw it out there. Thank you. Okay, so that wraps up our public comments. Um, the next item is to consider approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Stacy, I'll make that motion to approve the uh, previous meeting minutes with the correction of Mr. Demansky's name. It says here DJ, but it should be CJ. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Well, I really want to thank everyone for coming out, not only to this meeting, but to the previous meetings. We've had a lot of good discussion on this topic. Um, we've we've kind of we've spent a lot of time going back and forth on things. And so I wanted to explain what happened since the last meeting for everyone. Um, so since the last committee meeting on July 31st, additional work has been done on the draft ordinance as folks have pointed out. Um, and this is per instruction by the committee to include feedback by some of our members. That version is what we have in front of us today. Um, as we explain and discuss this version, I ask all of you to please put it in the perspective of what is right at this time for Sawyer County? The answer is a compromise and a balance. That's always been the answer. However, it's taken a long time for us to get this far. The balance, please consider tourism versus residents quality of life. We've heard a lot about that from our residents the balance of the most effective use of county human resources, because we know we're challenged in that area as well, although we've got some great people. Balance the obvious need to protect our water for the long-term versus short-term financial gain. That seems to be pretty simple to me. I'm asking um, Matt, we'll go through and quickly look at the changes with us so that everybody understands what was changed. And then we're gonna open up the floor to discussion um, to the committee only on these changes and this current version. With the sincere desire to move a version, not necessarily this one, something like it, forward to the HHS board. I hope that all of you feel as I do that this is our window um, to get something done and to do something that again is right for Sawyer County. And with that, I'll ask uh, Matt to go ahead and give us a quick walkthrough. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so yeah, after the conclusion of the last meeting, I did hear from several individuals as um, the meeting minutes noted that just take in consideration some of the concerns um, and try to apply it to these ordinances as best as possible. Now, not saying that everybody's wishes are in here and that everything that was um, brought forth to us was implemented in here. This is 
listening to those suggestions and doing the best we can to, like you said, trying to find that balance, that compromise. Um, first thing on page six of the agenda, um, which is 1449 owner's responsibilities. Uh, some additional language has been added. So anything in green is new language. Um, posting a license. Um, I know Laura, I think, mentioned at the last meeting, and I've heard it from a couple of different people too. So I just want to clarify that it is currently a requirement through DACAP that the license is posted. So in the rent, well, let me back up. Um, when this code was written, it was before tourist rooming houses or short-term rentals got really popular. So it was, uh, the code was essentially designed for um, the intent of hotels and motels. So that license was supposed to be posted in a public area. So most often in a lobby, an office or a check-in location, that's where that license was supposed to be posted. So guests knew that they were getting their inspections. They were a licensed facility. Over time, we, you know, the tourist rooming houses became popular and that still re was a requirement for those types of facilities as well, but it wasn't to be posted by, uh, so it's visible to the neighbors or the public, it's to be posted for the guests in that uh, rental unit to know that it is a licensed facility. So just kind of a clarification on that. Um, so posting the license, uh, owner shall post current license or licenses issued by Surrey County Health and Human Services in a place visible to guests. It's kind of already something we do, um, but to kind of add in this next language, required signage, a placard approximately eight by 10 inches in size shall be placed at the junction of the main driveway and adjoining streets. The sign must contain the name, the contact information of the owner or owner's agent, the license number and approved occupancy of the tourist rooming house. The sign is not uh, required to be displayed when the owner is not operating the property as a rental. Um, we This has gone around a little bit. I think our initial, and to be one of our earlier versions, we had something like this in there. It's come back around. Um, I, at this point, I'd like, uh, Rebecca, if you could um, chime in on this and kind of present your thoughts on, on this subject. You bet. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I understand that, you know, there were comments and requests made um, for the placard um, at the meeting last month. Um, and it was inserted into the draft, which is in front of you now, obviously. Um, I do have some concerns from a legal standpoint um, based on case law that uh, talks heavily about distinguishing and differential treatment between commercial uses and residential uses. And even if it is a short-term rental use, the county cannot apply or others cannot apply commercial standards or practices. The hanging the placard out, I could see could easily be construed as a commercial type practice um, and it is not required for residential uses, um, but it is being required for commercial use. So again, I do have legal concerns um, about this provision, um, but it's only my job to advise of those legal concerns and the committee um, can simply take those into consideration and um, make your decision whether to move forward. Uh, I just make, Phil Nice, I just make a comment. Uh, most of the short-term rentals that are out there currently have signs that say Happy Acres called Phil. Anyway, but uh, I, I think I, I really can't quite get my arms around what you said, Rebecca, because I, all we're doing is posting uh, uh, for somebody to get a hold of it. It does not have to be, we're not putting commercial uh, requirements on, on a commercial property that is being used as, but in the same token, I, 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 uh, I would risk nobody's going to take us to court over a placard. So uh, that would be my comment. Is there a safety concern? If I could ask uh, Chief Savitsky, is there a safety concern of putting a placard out that would have that information on it? 
I don't think there'd be a sensitive, any sensitive information on there to where people could contest it. Your email, your address, your name. I don't know. It's all stuff you can find online anyways. Okay. Thank you. I guess I have a follow-up because if a neighbor was to request such information through a public records request, they could obtain that information anyways. So I don't know if that would be a huge sticking point to have that additional signage for a TRH, but I understand the legal aspects. One of the comments that was made before was it would make people that were going to rob a place know it was a rental. And by allowing the person to remove the sign when he's not running it, then I think then that's what it says in the last sentence. I think that covers that. Yep, Cheryl. If we're going to go back to commercial versus residential, then what I think we got to do is set up a special use permit and the people go through some type of uh, vetting in order to become a tourist rooming house. All right, that if, you were, if we're going to get into commercial and residential and we're picking and choosing, if you can't put a placard up here so that at 2 o'clock in the morning and somebody's raising hell next door, I know who to call, who the agent or the owner is that I can call, and they can attend to it rather than the sheriff's department or the Hayward City cops or whoever it might be. And so I think we'd have to differentiate that to begin with where we're going. If we're, that means that a special use permit has to be done and we're back at more meetings or... Jay and his staff is working on it, then I think that's the direction we're going if we're going to be held up by a legal loophole such as this, that you can't make a complaint to the people who are ultimately responsible for what's going wrong. I agree, sure. Unusually, yeah. we agree. Yes, yeah. we yes. do. Anyway, but the I would add the comment, Doug made the comment about email address, and I, this probably isn't the time, but I don't want to get lost that mm -hmm. if this stays in, that that email address also be on the placard. But don't just so we don't forget it as we get down. So Yep. I'm go ahead, man. Um I'm try to not give my opinion and just try to present facts, but I'm just throwing out a hypothetical situation and you take it however. Um but I just Thinking of a situation at two o'clock in the morning where something's going on and the neighbors, okay, getting frustrated, they want to get that information, right? Is this, by posting this placard, and I guess I, um, maybe the location is where it's the, the key point here, but does this give that person the right to go onto that property to get that information? It should be visible from the right of way. That's if the it's point. In the right of way, it should be in the right of way. It's yeah, not the, uh, that's what we've got by the corner. I think. Yeah, the main driveway when it hits. You're and and I would hope that folks would go and get this information before two o'clock in the morning. But and you know, well, in the first place, Matt, if I live next door to one, which I did for a long time, uh, but my point is that. Uh, uh, I I wouldn't be going over at two o'clock in the morning. The minute I knew it was a rental and they had the placard up, I'd be going over my little notebook and write it down because uh, running out in my underwear at two o'clock in the morning is not a good sight. But so don't we, there. sorry, don't we already address that though by having the homeowner or owner's agent in mail that information to them later on in the? That's a, that's a limited group. This is more. Posting for the sake of a larger group of people. The problem with the problem with mailing is like most things. Well, where do you find it afterwards? Later. Yeah. I mean, I got it. And so am I going to have it? But that is the next sub subject. Yeah. Okay. Right. We're going to talk about yep. mailing here in a minute. Um, Martin. Was... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Martin. Yeah, I'm just going to say that I'm in favor of the placard because uh, I think it addresses more than just the neighbors. If a person drives by and observes some bad behavior, that person then has the avenue of contacting the appropriate party. So I think you need to look broader than just the 200 feet and by having that placard that provides that notice. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate that this is something that the owners had brought up as well because they didn't want the first call to go to the sheriff. You know, this is an option for them to have something to say. So to me, it seems reasonable. Okay, go on. 
I just like to add that I think having the email so that you do have a track of it with an email going out. Yeah, that's a good. So thing. this getting an affidavit, you know, three days later, four days later, it's not going to happen, you know, and they're not going to. But then everyone's cooled down. The people are gone. They're no longer there. It's no longer the issue. But I think if you have an email and they do it at two thirty three a.m. and they send it, you know, and you'd have a copy of it also probably sent to Health and Human Services at the same time that that's where it would be copied to so that everyone in their notification, the next neighboring properties, whatever that, that would be on there. It's an excellent idea. Question. question. Uh -huh. um, so it just says contact information. So are you going to be more specific? Is that what you're requesting? More specific phone, email? Yes. Um, would it be appropriate then to put um, Matt's email on there too so that it, no. <laughs> well, I'm like, if you're if you're gonna send a complaint, and what she was just saying was that it would CC. How how would anybody know who to contact if you're not from Sawyer County and know that Matt is the? Do you have a mailbox that's not Matt's that you would? Right, we could direct them to go to our complaint general complaint website. Mm -hmm. And not just putting all of this on one that would also help you when it comes up to relicensing and you're looking for three complaints, you've got a track record on it. Mm -hmm. Yep. You might look at it and see that you got 18 on one house. Very good discussion. Any more on that one? Um, the, and to clarify on the driveway, should we be specific and say the right of way so it's not hidden back behind a tree? you know, something of that nature so that it's visible and put it right of way instead of just the end of drive. Visible from the right of way. I thought you were going to post them around on the fire sign. Let's not say that in this section. It's a great drive. If you could request that, it's your, your Is it part. legal to put it on the fire sign? I don't know. If they made it a sign that it went right on the bottom below the fire number? Yeah. Well, that's legal. Yeah. And then I'd say that we would add it so it went on the, underneath the fire number. And that makes okay. good sense because if it's magnetic, you can pull it off when they're gone. Easy peasy, you don't. The, the problem where some of the fire numbers are is a long, are a long ways from where the rental is. If you get into private driveways down the line, the, uh, the, true. the mailbox is way out there. So I so, don't just comment. Just clarification. So the recommendation for language is to place this information underneath the fire number? Is that correct? No. no. Visible. Go ahead, CJ. And, and then we can make those recommendations. Like you could put it on, you know, we can do that through guidance on how they could do it later. Sure. Right. Yeah, I don't think we need to get that much into the detail at this point. I was also going to mention, I have a couple rentals in the city of Shell Lake, and they actually make us put an 8x10 placard on, um, like whether it be the service store of the house or garage. So if it is a ways down from the fire number, um, and there was clarification of which property it actually was, maybe make it a little bit more clear. Um, like I said, just have it laminated, you know, taped to that piece of glass, easily accessible. Um, the problem we had with the uh, with, with with that recommendation was that the short term rental people weren't happy about having a signage placed on actually on the on the house, and so part of the compromise was find something which we we're trying to notify the neighbors without the neighbors having to have, have a problem having going up to the door uh, to get the information, which is at two o'clock in the morning is not a good thing either. No. So, but either thing, if it works, but uh, I, I guess I be hard. And I completely understand what you're saying. I mean, for me being in the rental business, I want my name and my information anywhere possible. I want people to contact me directly. I want to handle those issues before they become bigger issues. So I feel if I have a sign at the fire number, I have a sign at the property, I mean, the, the neighbors, what? Yeah. Well, I guess on like a private road where your fire numbers are a quarter mile, half mile away from the property, have another sign visible so you know this is the Lively Loon rental or, or whatever the name may be. Um, I just feel like there's too many owners, managers, management companies that aren't doing their due diligence that are giving all of these rentals a bad name, you know? property owners that don't care about it, just looking to make money. 
And obviously I'm in the business. Yeah, the goal is to make money, but the goal is to create great experiences in Sawyer County with our resources. I mean, why we all live here and enjoy it. So if someone's not willing to do it, maybe they don't need to have a license. Maybe they don't need to be, you know, landlord, rental. Um, I just feel like it's pretty easy. You know, go the extra step, go the extra mile, get rid of the problems right away. And if there are problems, deal with them. Thank you. If it, if it does go up to being on the fire number sign, you would also want to list because you're going to have instances where you're going to have multiple fire numbers on one post. And at that point, then you're going to also want to list the specific address for the rental and not just an arbitrary, hey, we are renting. Because there could be three fire numbers associated with the one post. Right. I mean, multiple. Yeah. yeah. It's all good. It's it's implementation stuff. I'm not sure we need to put that in the in the ordinance, but I think we all get the gist of where we're going here. The more communication, the better. More info, the better. Yep. So we'll work on that to address all those points. Um, make sure I capture all the verbiage correctly. Uh, any more on that particular subject matter? Okay. Moving on to <clears throat> letter D on the same page, notification to neighbor neighboring properties. Um, we did adjust that instead of doing certified mail, because in some situations that could, could be quite a few individuals or uh, adjacent properties. So um, we just took out the word certified and then we did change it to 200 feet. We started initially at 300. We went down to 100. Now we're kind of settling in the middle here at 200. And you'll see that again in number two, the same language. Uh, number three, the owner shall provide, and then the yellow is the added language, upon request by Sawyer County Health Officer, a copy of the letter and list of all notifications sent to neighboring properties. Failure to provide said list and or uh, letter of notifications to neighboring properties as required by this section shall be a basis upon which to terminate the license. So um, basically saying that at some point, you know, we're not necessarily probably going to ask every single time, but you know, um, after this is implemented, be like, hey, can you just show me your le your letter that you sent out and a list of people you sent it to, you know, something on those lines. So um, that's what that language is addressing there. Any comments on that? Question on zoning changes. Don't you go within 300 feet of everyone? Yes. Why wouldn't we do 300 feet of everyone? If you can do it for zoning change, why couldn't you do it for something like this? Because you're really changing zoning use of these people's properties. Yeah. For zoning changes, those are done by departmental staff. This would be done by the TRH owner, um, which I mean could be depending on a specific area. I think we took for an example one that was in the city, and within 300 feet of that property within the city, it like 90 some different properties. So you're talking about mailing out 90 different letters. And if I'm 287 feet yeah. away, I probably didn't even care that this was a TRH rental, especially if I was in the city, because I never even knew it about it. So that's where we compromised back from three to one to two. The three was only chosen just because, yeah, that was a zoning, um, I guess, uh, buffer distance in the past. But with this not being a specific zoning ordinance, I, I don't know if we need the connection, but that's... that's well, the wanted. city of Hayward has their own zoning ordinance, is correct? Uh, they do. They do. So couldn't you exclude the city of Hayward? Well, that would get with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean not exclude. I just mean for the 300 feet limit. If you excluded the city of Hayward for the 300 foot limit and had a 100 foot limit or whatever, part, 200 foot limit in the city of Hayward. Part of the problem in the discussion was if you looked at around the lakes. Um, yeah. So we look at around the lakes, a lot of these are flooded subdivisions that and we're mainly talking about Lakeshore. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what, that's where the importance is, but or not. Well, it's important for other people, too. But around the lakes, I mean, if you take Northwoods Beach, you would have, oh, my God. Uh, if you went 300 feet with all them 30 foot lots and half those people live in. Chicago and I've owned the lot since 1927 and never whatever they keep paying a dollar two cents but and uh, and there's a lot of subdivisions around other lakes which encompass a lot more people and to be fair to the you know if 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 I'm uh, in a subdivision 
and at 300 feet away, I doubt I'm going to be affected primarily by the, it's the guy next door that's primarily affected. So that's where I come back to try to find some kind of reasonable, reasonability to it and not make it so over cumbersome. And so anyway, that was, that was a reasoning anyway. So. Okay. Martin. Yeah, I had the same question as Cheryl and, um, uh, I would be in support of the 300 uh, in as much as it, it doesn't create these different boundaries for different things in Sawyer County. Let's keep it consistent. It is kind of a zoning issue. I know we bounce back and forth on that, but I support the 300 uh, in as much to be consistent. And if it hits 90 properties, that's what it hits. That's what it's gonna take for the applicant to get the license. Okay, um, I'm encouraging folks at this point to keep those those items that they want to change in mind for when we may get to a point to have a motion made. All right, we'll continue to go through. Um, so that's it on page six, moving to page seven. Oops. Number four um, under D is the owner shall take either owner or property manager shall take all reasonable measures to respond to any complaint. And I know we had discussion on that earlier. Um, what constitutes a response? If there's a couple more words, and I know it sounds a little nitpicky, but could we say something like the owner shall take um, all reasonable measures to facilitate resolution? Because if you're just saying respond, respond can easily be, well, it's two in the morning. I will deal with this tomorrow. You know, and and you could constitute that as reasonable, but I think if it's if it's stated that you you need to be looking towards a resolution of this problem, with who's complaining. Yeah, CJ, do you have a response? Yeah, I would also like to see that um, all reasonable complaints too. I mean, there have been some good complaints that have been brought up at the last couple of meetings, but there have also been some complaints that. I mean, are pretty unreasonable as well. So um, I would like to put that in consideration, whether there be three strikes, let's take a look at what those three complaints were before, you know. Right. <clears throat> so I noted that on number four there. Okay. Um, then going on to section 14.4.11 on page 7, uh, down to number 3. Um, basically, that's where we added plus 2. And again, for clarification, that is plus 2 for the whole facility, not per bedroom. Yeah, and I want to talk about this for a minute because this is a big deal, right? This is, this is a very big deal. Um, when this committee first started, the first thing that was moved was to follow state statutes with regard to septic. Um, the committee then twice looked at a commercial option and tabled that twice. So I feel like the, t the, the committee has already sort of laid a groundwork for two and following the state statutes. The reason why we put this in here was for this discussion of plus two there are other counties that have done that. Um, when we just spoke with, with Rebecca, she had indicated she thought that that would be okay from a legal standpoint. But the question is, which is the right way to go? Open it up for thoughts on that. Um, so so it, to me, it reads that it's plus two per bedroom. So if we could clarify that it's plus two per household, Per, per to, structure, yeah. Yeah, per or per per rental, whatever wording, per facility, whatever. But otherwise, it does read like it's two extra in each bedroom. So if you could clarify that, that would mean a lot. I had that same concern as I was typing this up. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and I have a question uh, as far as a holding tank. I mean, nothing is said in there. You know, a holding tank is whatever. You know, I mean, as far as like a, a three bedroom septic system, so a three bedroom septic system, we're proposing you can sleep two, four, six, eight people total with the plus two. 
well, if there's a three bedroom house with a holding tank, what are we proposing? Then we go back to the cubic footage of, of those rooms. So and it's so more or less like if it was a on a, a city sewer. So what would that be? That just so the what, what we've been currently using for the last five years as a requirement by by DAGCAP is that um, for every for a bedroom we take we measure the cubic uh, footage of that room and then we divide that by either two hundred uh, for children or four hundred cubic feet um, for adults. And that's how we determine how many can stay in a particular room. And I'll, I'll just mention that there has been some additional discussion at the zoning committee level that we are looking at uh, potentially opening up our pouts ordinance right now. So your county is known as a system of choice, which means you can install a holding tank at your choice if you wanted to. There is a, uh, I guess, initial discussions uh, transpiring that would change it to a system of last resort where if you had the soils conducive for a conventional and had area available for a conventional sewer system, you could not just go the holding tank option. Um, again, those do kind of go hand in hand uh, with the TRH ordinance, and those are conversations transpiring through the zoning committee level. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that that conversation regarding holding tanks is an important one for the county regardless um, uh, is how we do business in, in new construction. So um, TRH is our part of it for sure, but that's not the only reason to make that change at a zoning committee level. Yep, Martin. Just my opinion on this. I thought we had gone down this road and I was comfortable where we were at before the plus two was added, I understand motivation to add plus two but as an engineer it seems arbitrary to me and i would not be able to support the plus two okay i think the discussion over a period of time and i'm not advocating uh, uh i really a firm believer should be two two and that's it but you know the objective and then talking to different people and talking to if we could, if we had a three bedroom home and we could get the occupancy down to eight rather than 18, I mean, come on, uh, what's too, I mean, it's, you got three bedroom, that's six, so you add two, so that's eight. And so to make it as palatable and reasonable as possible, if I, I, I personally do not have a problem with the plus two, because I think it's, it's the right direction. We're not talking about plus 10 or anything. I mean, our, our, the objective and the problems that we've had is, is over occupancy. The more people you get in there, the more problems you have. And that's simple as that. So anyway. I'm a big advocate of the plus two um, for the simple fact that, yeah, exactly what you said, Phil. Um, three bedroom house, cabin, sleep six people plus two is eight. I feel like Eric, the sanitarian, probably give us some better numbers on what, you know, a conventional septic system is rated per, per bedroom as far as gallons per day. Um, but I guess you, you see a, a full-time resident that's using their house as a house or their, their family comes up. Are there times where they're going to over occupy those guidelines? Yeah, absolutely. We're not going to enforce it there, um, so I feel like the plus two it, it is good. I mean, we're we're, we're strict, you know, we're tightening down on the regulations. But I, what, Eric? Could you give us a few numbers on what it is per day as far as bedroom, um, as gallons per day per bedroom? Residential sizing is 150 gallons per day per bedroom. Break that down to two persons per bedroom, 75 gallons per day per person. Um, I would just like to see some platform for my regulatory aspect of my job. I've been following state statutes, state code, and ordinances, and currently state statute, state code does not list plus two. Um, 
I'm not disagreeing with it. And I think these rental units that rent 26 weeks out of the year and they have down periods might perform correctly, but uh, there are probably some rental units that are highly sought after and rented 52 weeks out of the year. Um, I don't have any numbers showing an increased failure rate. I don't know if that's gonna come out at some point, but I do know it's drawn a lot of attention with plumbers, designers, and soil testers asking this question as to how to properly size um, septic systems. And um, again, I just like to reach out to DSPS and DATCAP to get some help for all the counties dealing with um, these difficult decisions and designing septic systems. So CJ, did that answer your question for residents? Yes. Okay. Okay, any more discussion on this one? All right. <clears throat> we'll go on. Excuse me. <clears throat> Moving on to page nine, um, under calls for service, uh, like it was mentioned earlier, we did change the, the number of calls for service in a certain amount of times. So we changed that from five to three or more calls for service within a three month period versus a one calendar year may result in the revocation of a TR license. Any discussion on that? And then finally, last page um, under 14414, denial and of a um, denial and revocation of a license. We added this language um, revocation of a license. Sawyer County Health and Human Services shall provide notification to each owner of real property within 200 feet or 300 feet, depending on what we decide, of the perimeter of a TRH property should a TRH license be revoked. This is to basically, um, you know, if we have ongoing situations and we can't get resolved and we end up denying or more so revoking a license, then us as Sawyer County would then inform uh, those facilities or properties within the 200, 300 um, perimeter, foot perimeter. And there was discussion on this in the last meeting about notifying the neighbors upon a renewal. This we thought was just a more efficient way to do that. Rather than saying every year that it was renewed, notify them if it's not renewed, because that would be more important information for them to have and less work. And this would be because of you know, situations that can't, couldn't be resolved, ongoing problems. This would not necessarily be for those facilities that basically drop out of being a rental and no longer require a license. We would not, I don't think, be no. uh, informing the neighbors of that uh, scenario. I think previously, I mean, it was stated that the owner would have to, sir, the, the, the uh, church rooming house owner would have to send it out to uh, the people that his license had been re revoked. And I don't think that was ever going to happen. So, <laughs> and where it should come from, the county should be, it's like, you know, by the way, this, the license has been revoked and the county should be responsible for that. So, okay. Martin. Yes, uh, you referenced the discussion about notification upon renewals. And I think the point of that discussion was to try and capture new neighbors within that 300 feet boundary that may not know that that TRH was existing there. And so that notification would capture changes in ownership within that envelope. Yeah, right. Martin, I don't, don't, you, don't you feel that having the, the placard out there is going to be, I mean, obviously everybody who, the neighbors who drive by down that street every day are going to see that placard. Yeah, I, I agree with that in terms of taking any action, but if I'm a prospective purchaser, I guess it, that wouldn't make a difference. I'll, I'll withdraw my comment. And, and just for clarification, the we're asking each year that they're notifying neighbors as part of their Renewal, yeah. Oh, part of their renewal, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. 
Okay. All right. Well, we've gone through. Um, yeah, let's. I guess uh, I just, before you go too far, okay. I just want to make sure that that is solidified in order. Is that a, a renewal of a license also requires notification? Uh, that's a good question, maybe. I have to the initial. I don't know if it says that right now. And if we want that in there, we should put that in there. If we could add the word annually in that page six, uh, number three. Well, the owner shall provide upon request uh, Omni Brain properties. So if you're saying that they have to if they have to notify their neighbors annually. And yeah, so we should add that word annually. Yep. Either that or you add it back onto page five under 14, four, five, parent two, parent somewhere in there, which is the renewal portion. It goes page four, page five for the renewal portion. It's page under five. term renewal of a TRH license, 14.45. Let's put it in B. both places just to be safe. Four, five term renewal TRH. And then probably under two, each renewal request should include the following. Or put it as a, I don't know how you would want to format it in there, but you really should have it in those multiple places then. Um, just so that the TRH owner is aware that they have to send out annual letters to adjacent property owners or whatever distance it may turn out to be. Okay, I'm just going to give a quick recap on what I think we've agreed the changes would be. Um, now, this does not include any of the things that we haven't decided, but we have agreed that um, the um, 8x10 placard should include the owner's agent name, address, phone number, and email. And occupancy. And occupancy. Owner agent. Yeah. And in this agreement, what we agreed to, we went to vote. You see the county contact tool with that on that sign? Uh, yeah, so I would note that um, we would add. You got to put here. Oops, sorry. Phone sorry. email, HHS email. We would add the, the complaint site. Yeah, what yep. site? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll put on mine. And we've agreed to add the annually to the um, owner shall provide upon request by Sawyer County Health Officer a copy of the letter. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the one previous that they should send that within 200 feet of the perimeter of the TRH property. Annual. Yeah, not um, Did we agree on the two hundred as opposed to as, as a compromise between one hundred and three hundred? If it's going to change. Well, there was some people said this would be three hundred, so. Can we do that by roll call? You can make a motion and do it by roll call or by voice vote, either one. Just to get a gauge of who wants the 200 to change. Yeah, I mean, it's up to the, if you want a division, you can call it as a roll call vote. No, it's just Well, they're saying that it doesn't need to be a vote. It sounds like to me that it would need to be a motion. You can, I mean, 
You just do a straw poll. I think it's four. Just raise Either your hands. How many's in favor of 200? Yeah. How many's in favor of 200? Raise your hands. You better put you. Oh. How many is in favor of 200? Why raise your hands? How many is in favor of 300? It's 300. Okay. Okay. So that has to be changed. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Just, Madam Chair, I think, I don't know if Matt or you, uh, I've got some notes, but I think like you're making the edits you want, and then at the end you're going to make a motion to adopt all those in, correct? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Got it. Right, so now I think we're down to two plus two. All in favor of two. Um, <laughs> I'm not familiar with the straw vote. <laughs> oh, oh, is it okay? Is it okay to do straw votes? It is because this is like a working meeting. You're mm -hmm. yeah, we're working. trying to make okay. trying to put together your draft ordinance. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, all right, then let's just see a show of hands. All those that want to stay with two. Okay, and all those that want to go with two plus two. So it's Thank two you. plus two. As long as it's clarified that it's the plus two for the whole facility and yeah, not per bedroom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yep. Right. Excuse me. And then we'll be adding the information on the um, holding tank as well. I, I don't think we have to. No, we, don't. we don't have to. No. As far as the cubic footage in that? Yeah. No, we wouldn't have to because that's part of state okay. statute. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. CJ, just to clarify, a holding tank is a pelt. So we would take into consideration design standards for pouts with holding tanks, mounds, at grades, conventionals. They're all term pouts. So it does include holding yep. tanks. So we need a motion. Okay. We've covered all the issues. So I, I will make a motion that with the changes and the straw podium, which has the two plus two and so forth that we've just gone through, that that the uh, easy read uh, proposal, uh, we would approve it to be sent to uh, HN, uh, the Human Services Committee at this point. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, Andy, can you take a roll call on this one? Thank you so much for doing all this for us today, Andy. So just to clarify the motion before you take a vote, is that Phil made the motion, is that CJ made the second? Yes. To send the draft ordinance. With to, the changes with, that, as with discussed. The changes as discussed to the Human Services Board. All right. The only discussion is on on that on that item for what constitutes response or oh, just some right. verbiage change maybe to, to yeah I made note of that okay I think we can incorporate okay. that okay right. roll call vote on the motion Stacy Hessel yes Marshall Savitsky yes. John Volmers. We'll come back. Uh, Cheryl Treland. Yes. CJ Demansky. Yes. Martin Hansen. No. Laura Rusk. Yes. Jenny Chabek. Yes. Phil Neese. Yes. And just go back, John Bulmers. He said he was muted and unable to unmute. So I don't know if it was something that the host muted. That was our feedback one before. I'm not even sure which one he is. The telephone number. Hmm. 
I can't I can't unmute him either. No. No. Six five one number skills. Yeah. So we'll just put him down as an abstention at this point. I don't have any. Could, could he add it to the chat? He's on a phone. He wouldn't have the chat. Oh, I, I see. He's, okay. He's just listening. Gotcha. But there is a way you can unmute when you're on a phone. Yep. Star eight. I think so. John, you might have to unmute yourself if you're hearing this. I think um, there's parameters of us. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Hello. So, John, the motion on the floor. The whole time, so. Yeah, I've been muted the whole time, so my answer is no. I was unable to speak prior. Okay. There's seven yeses votes and two no votes. The motion carries. Good job. Thank you, everyone. Okay, um, just to sort of make sure that we don't leave something hanging here, I did want to talk more about the, um, the next item, which is the Lake Association's role. Um, we've gone back and forth. We've shown some examples of the Lake Association books. A lot of our associations have rules that need to be available to the renters but we didn't actually close a loop on this. So I wanted to get some discussion from the group on where you think we need to go. Doesn't need to necessarily be in the agenda, I mean, in the, um, the ordinance, but there should be some follow-up to share information about the Lake Association. Go ahead, Cece. Um, I think that that should Can be addressed after. Just one moment. Um, that should be addressed after we go through the HHS hearing, I think, just in case that they want to speak at that. Okay. And I'm in agreement with that. I want to stick with this as well. Yep. We had someone online. Yeah, but it sounds like uh, that'll be pushed to the next time. Can't hear you? Say it again, John. Sorry, is the, the Lake Association thing, is that going to be brought up or is that the next time? Lake Association. Well, you can yeah. certainly speak to it now. I mean, that's why it's on our agenda. But we also wanted to make sure that we follow okay. up with this in the next phase. Yeah, so I'll bring it up. Uh, my Lovejoy house. The uh, unofficial lake association deems it a no wake lake, and it actually is not. So I don't think the rules should be relevant when the lake association is making up rules that are not legal. Yeah, that's a specific situation. I'm not sure that we need to address at this point. Are you looking for something general for all the lakes? Are you looking specific that Spider Lake would have one and Chippewa Flowage would have one and Lost Land would have one and Whitefish would have one? They so mostly do. a specific lake there. Right. And they mostly do have their own, you know, information that they pass out. Yeah. I guess the recommendation I would have is that <clears throat> um, one thing that we're going to provide when somebody applies for a license is a, a packet of information. It's going to basically be a one packet that covers everything from Sawyer County as a, a licensing agent. Um, but if there's something that individual counties want, they can always, um, you know, request through open records, a list of those facilities that are rentals and they could send that information to them. Um, maybe another way without, just off the top of my head is that maybe we have, if we know that they're in whatever township, they can get that packet, I guess, or something like that. There's might be a different couple of ways, but again, it would be something outside the ordinance and just be guidance for, for those facilities. Just as a suggestion. Okay. Where you end up having just general things like distances from docks, you know, 
under power, not slow to awake, et cetera, slow to awake zones, et cetera. The best thing that works, and everyone reads it, is you get refrigerator magnets, you put it on there, you print it on the refrigerator, you put it on there, no one touches them. They all read them because everyone's in the refrigerator at some time or other, much better than giving you a pack of stuff that no one's ever going to look at. So yep. refrigerator magnets work great, <laughs> and they stay there. They'll be there year after year. We use them like if a fishing size limit changes or something like that, poof, it's in the magnet on the refrigerator. Picture what the fish is, the difference between a northern and a walleye, whatever it might be. You know, um, the, but the refrigerator magnets work really, really well. And if you were doing something like that with general boating regulations, fire regulations, just general outdoor education type of things, you could do it. You could probably get them easily under a buck a piece and just make it part of the licensing process that they're going to get it. And this gets on your refrigerator. It works great. I, I'm very much in favor of that. And like I said, I think we can continue to work with HHS on implementation. But I did want to make sure that we didn't forget that piece. Okay. All right. So um, how do we feel about a follow-up meeting at this point? I make a motion that there will never be another follow-up meeting. And... Uh, <laughs> somebody please second it <laughs> i'm 83 as of this week and i this has been going on for me for five years so i i don't have much time left. <laughs> i think it, it de depends on what happens at hhs so I sure think it's too premature to decide that yeah. so I, I just want to make sure that everybody doesn't throw away their um notes and their contact information because we may be reaching out to you again in the future but we may not so we may also be done so we're not going to, um, and we're not going to go ahead and schedule another meeting right now. Was there any other correspondence reports or conference meetings or anything like that to be discussed today? If not, then we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.